Chapter Eight: The Mysterious Brougham. That tragic evening was bad for everybody. Carlotta fell ill. As for Christine Daae, she disappeared after the performance. A fortnight elapsed, during which she was neither seen at the opera nor outside. Raoul, of course, was the first to be astonished at the prima donna's absence. He wrote to her at Madame Valeria's flat and received no reply. His grief increased, and he ended by being seriously alarmed at never seeing her name on the programme. Faust was played without her. One afternoon he went to the manager's office to ask the reason of Christine's disappearance. He found them both looking extremely worried. Their own friends did not recognize them. They had lost all their gaiety and spirits. They were seen crossing the stage with hanging heads, careworn brows, pale cheeks, as though pursued by some abominable thought or prey to some persistent sport of fate. The fall of the chandelier had involved them in no little responsibility, but it was difficult to make them speak about it. The inquest had ended in a verdict of accidental death, caused by the wear and tear of the chains by which the chandelier hung from the ceiling, but it was the duty of both the old and the new managers to have discovered this wear and tear, and to have remedied it in time. And I feel bound to say that Messieurs Richard and Montcharmin at this time appeared so changed, so absent-minded, so mysterious, so incomprehensible, that many of the subscribers thought that some event, even more horrible than the fall of the chandelier, must have affected their state of mind. In their daily intercourse, they showed themselves very impatient, except with Madame Giry, who had been reinstated in her functions. And their reception of the Vicomte de Chagny, when he came to ask about Christine, was anything but cordial. They merely told him that she was taking a holiday. He asked how long the holiday was for, and they replied curtly that it was for an unlimited period, as Mademoiselle Daae had requested a leave of absence for reasons of health. Then she is ill, he cried. What is the matter with her? We don't know. Didn't you send the doctor of the opera to see her? No, she did not ask for him and as we trust her, we took her word. Raoul left the building a prey to the gloomiest thoughts. He had resolved, come what might, to go and inquire of Mamma Valerius. He remembered the strong phrases in Christine's letter, forbidding him to make any attempt to see her. But what he had seen at Perros, what he had heard behind the dressing-room door, his conversation with Christine at the edge of the moor, made him suspect some machination which, devilish though it might be, was none the less human. The girl's highly strung imagination, her affectionate and credulous mind, the primitive education which had surrounded her childhood with a circle of legends, the constant brooding over her dead father, and above all, the state of sublime ecstasy into which music threw her from the moment that this art was made manifest to her in certain exceptional conditions, as in the churchyard at Perros, all this seemed to him to constitute a moral ground only too favourable for the malevolent designs of some mysterious and unscrupulous person. Of whom was Christine Daae the victim? This was the very reasonable question which Raoul put to himself as he hurried off to Mamma Valerius. He trembled as he rang at a little flat in the rue Notre-Dame-des-Victoires. The door was opened by the maid, whom he had seen coming out of Christine's dressing-room one evening. He asked if he could speak to Madame Valerius. He was told that she was ill in bed and was not receiving visitors. "'Take in my card, please,' he said. The maid soon returned and showed him into a small and scantily furnished drawing-room in which portraits of Professor Valerius and old Daae hung on opposite walls. "'Madame begs Monsieur le Vicomte to excuse her.' said the servant she can only see him in her bedroom because she can no longer stand on her poor legs five minutes later raoul was ushered into an ill-lit room where he at once recognized the good kind face of christine's benefactress in the semi-darkness of an alcove mamma valerius's hair was now quite white but her eyes had grown no older never on the contrary had their expression been so bright so pure so childlike Monsieur de Chagny, she cried gaily, putting out both her hands to her visitor. Ah, it's heaven that sends you here. 
we can talk of her the last sentence sounded very gloomy in the young man's ears he at once asked madame where is christine and the old lady replied calmly she is with her good genius what good genius exclaimed poor raoul why the angel of music the viscount dropped into a chair really christine was with the angel of music and there lay mamma valerius in bed smiling to him and putting her finger to her lips to warn him to be silent and she added you must not tell anybody you can rely on me said raoul he hardly knew what he was saying for his ideas about christine already greatly confused were becoming more and more entangled and it seemed as if everything was beginning to turn around him around the room around that extraordinary good lady with the white hair and the forget-me-not eyes i know i know i can she said with a happy laugh but why don't you come near me as you used to do when you were a little boy give me your hands as when you brought me the story of little lottie which daddy daye had told you i am very fond of you monsieur raoul you know and so is christine too she's fond of me sighed the young man he found a difficulty in collecting his thoughts and bringing them to bear on madame valeria's good genius on the angel of music on whom christine had spoken to him so strangely on the death's head which he had seen in a sort of nightmare on the high altar at perros and also on the opera ghost whose fame had come to his ears one evening when he was standing behind the scenes within hearing of a group of scene-shifters who were repeating the ghastly description which the hanged man joseph bouquet had given of the ghost before his mysterious death he asked in a low voice what makes you think that christine is fond of me madame she used to speak of you every day really and what did she tell you she told me that you had made her a proposal and the good old lady began laughing whole-heartedly raoul sprang from his chair flushing to the temples suffering agonies what's this where are you going sit down again at once will you do you think i will let you go like that if you're angry with me for laughing i beg your pardon after all what has happened isn't your fault didn't you know did you think that christine was free is christine engaged to be married the wretched raoul asked in a choking voice why no why no you know as well as i do that christine couldn't marry even if she wanted to but i don't know anything about it why can't christine marry because of the angel of music of course i, I don't follow yes he forbids her to he forbids her the angel of music forbids her to marry oh he forbids her without forbidding her it's like this he tells her that if she got married she would never hear him again that's all and that he would go away forever so you understand she can't let the angel of music go it's quite natural yes echoed raoul submissively it's quite natural besides i thought christine had told you all that when she met you at perrault where she went with her good genius oh she went to perrault with her good genius did she that is to say he arranged to meet her down there in perrault churchyard at daae's grave he promised to play her the resurrection of lazarus on her father's violin raoul de chagny rose and with a very authoritative air pronounced these peremptory words madame will you have the goodness to tell me where that genius lives the old lady did not seem surprised at this indiscreet command she raised her eyes and said in heaven such simplicity baffled him he did not know what to say in the presence of this candid and perfect faith in a genius who came down nightly from heaven to haunt the dressing-rooms at the opera he now realized the possible state of mind of a girl brought up between a superstitious fiddler and a visionary old lady and he shuddered when he thought of the consequences of it all is christine still a good girl he asked suddenly in spite of himself i swear it as i hope to be saved exclaimed the old woman who this time seemed to be incensed and if you doubt it sir i don't know what you are here for raoul tore at his gloves how long has she known this genius about three months yes it's quite three months since he began to give her lessons the viscount threw up his arms with a gesture of despair the genius gives her lessons and where 
her prey. Now that she has gone away with him, I can't say. But up to a fortnight ago it was in Christine's dressing room. It would be impossible in this little flat. The whole house would hear them. Whereas at the opera, at eight o'clock in the morning, there is no one about, do you see? Yes, I see. I see. Cried the Viscount, and he hurriedly took leave of Madame Valerius, who asked herself if the young nobleman was not a little off his head. He walked home to his brother's house in a pitiful state. He could have struck himself, banged his head against the walls, to think that he had believed in her innocence, in her purity. The angel of music, he knew him now, he saw him. It was beyond a doubt some unspeakable tenor, a good-looking jackanapes who mouthed and simpered as he sang. He thought himself as absurd and wretched as he could be. Oh, what a miserable, little, insignificant, silly young man was Monsieur le Vicomte de Chagny, thought Raoul furiously. And she, what a bold and damnable sly creature. His brother was waiting for him, and Raoul fell into his arms like a child. The Count consoled him without asking for explanations, and Raoul would certainly have long hesitated before telling him the story of the Angel of Music. His brother suggested taking him out to dinner. Overcome as he was with despair, Raoul would probably have refused any invitation that evening, if the Count had not, as an inducement, told him that the lady of his thoughts had been seen the night before, in the company of the other sex in the bois. At first the Viscount refused to believe, but he received such exact details that he ceased protesting. She had been seen, it appeared, driving in a brougham with the window down. She seemed to be slowly taking in the icy night air. There was a glorious moon shining. She was recognized beyond a doubt. As for her companion, only his shadowy outline was distinguished leaning back in the dark. The carriage was going at a walking pace in a lonely drive behind the grand stand at Longchamp. Raoul, dressed in frantic haste, prepared to forget his distress by flinging himself, as people say, into the vortex of pleasure. Alas, he was a very sorry guest, and leaving his brother early, found himself by ten o'clock in the evening in a cab behind the Longchamp racecourse. It was bitterly cold. The road seemed deserted and very bright under the moonlight. He told the driver to wait for him patiently at the corner of a near turning, and hiding himself as well as he could, stood stamping his feet to keep warm. He had been indulging in this healthy exercise for half an hour or so, when a carriage turned the corner of the road and came quietly in his direction at a walking pace. As it approached, he saw that a woman was leaning her head from the window and suddenly the moon shed a pale gleam over her features. Christine! The sacred name of his love had sprung from his heart and his lips. He could not keep it back. He would have given anything to withdraw it, for that name, proclaimed in the stillness of the night, had acted as though it were a preconcerted signal for a furious rush on the part of the whole turnout, which dashed past him before he could put into execution his plan of leaping at the horses' heads. The carriage window had been closed, and the girl's face had disappeared, and the brougham, behind which he was now running, was no more than a black spot on the white road. He called out again, Christine! No reply, and he stopped in the midst of the silence. With a lacklustre eye he stared down that cold, desolate road into the pale, dead night. Nothing was colder than his heart, nothing half so dead. He had loved an angel, and now he despised a woman. Raoul, how that little fairy of the north has trifled with you! Was it really, was it really necessary to have so fresh and so young a face, a forehead so shy and always ready to cover itself with a pink blush of modesty in order to pass in the lonely night, in a carriage and pair, accompanied by a mysterious lover? Surely there should be some limit to hypocrisy and lying. She had passed without answering his cry, and he was thinking of dying, and he was twenty years old. His valet found him in the morning sitting on his bed. He had not undressed, and the servant feared at the sight of his face that some disaster had occurred. Raoul snatched the letters from the man's hands. 
He had recognized Christine's paper and handwriting. She said, Dear, go to the masked ball in the opera on the night after tomorrow. At twelve o'clock, be in the little room behind the chimney place of the big crush room. Stand near the door that leads to the rotunda. Don't mention his appointment to anyone on earth. Wear a white domino and be carefully masked. As you love me, do not let yourself be recognized. Christine. End of chapter 8